I'm going to talk about uh, molecular communications and its relationship we may have with AI, not AI embedded into anybody, like AI maybe outside somewhere into some control system, and how we can use this kind of, um, let's say, merger team, right, to provide synthetic biological devices. And um, just before we get into that, I just want to advertise a little bit the lab we started in NSX, which is called Unconventional Communications and Computing Laboratory, which I've been appointed as the head. And of course, we have Professor Cooney and also as part of the academics there. So we, we use a lot of in silico inverted methods as well, uh, AI computational tools to investigate molecular communications, DNA data storage, synthetic biology, etc. So if you would like to know more, you can is, use the QR code there, or of course, you, because you, you cannot have go copy the link or Google as well. That should work. Right. Um, so I would like to introduce what is this unconventional world. Um, and the way I use unconventional is basically to, uh, let's say, group molecular communications with other types of channels as well, maybe ultrasound, maybe light. This all together, they can be part of something new. Um, of course, other people use non-conventional as well, and I think they reflect the same things, really. And it's good to start talking about this because we really need to define what are these unconventional world in terms of devices, uh, communications, and computing. And of course, we know a lot about communications and computing, and I think we need to maybe advance more what are these unconventional devices. But typically, unconventional devices, this idea that you build uh, devices not exclusively based on silicon and conventional material, you may include some living organisms as well. And it may also follow the, uh, or not follow, the von Neumann paradigm. So you don't really need to store information to have a device or may not have a battery to actually actuate uh, or to actually develop a device as well. So there are these new concepts that we can investigate. But of course, we know already molecular communications. We've been obviously talking about it for the, for this nice uh, workshop. And we also need to consider what's the relationship of molecules and other media, including RF, ultrasound, so that we can maybe use a packed unconventional communication technology. And that we could deliver unconventional computing. And I think that's very important, especially if we're building devices made of living organisms. So we need to, let's say, provide more complex solutions for what information processing we're doing or transmitting that we are doing and so forth. So we can rely on DNA, reaction, fusion, bioelectricity, enzymes, et cetera. And of course, there is a range of applications and I think uh, we have seen a lot today, especially in bioengineering, biology, and medicine. But um, I want to also talk about these really exciting uh, advancements in synthetic biology, because uh, typically we've seen um, the top-down and bottom-up approaches, and we are very well aware of this and its success, right? So for those who, who still uh, may, may not be familiar with this, we can build artificial cells based on natural cells if we have a synthetic gene that we can alter some kind of function inside it. But also we can build artificial cells made of non-living parts. And this is called the bottom-up approach. But ultimately we have a single artificial cell. What if we want to add this artificial cell to a living organism like, or even an organ? Would that be enough or even uh, sufficient to provide all these kind of applications that we want to do. So one of ideas of advancements in synthetic biology that we people are talking about that maybe we should consider is the tissue engineer based. So how to look at morphogenesis or how to like pack th these cells into a population, right, into some kind of format patterning, what kind of activity they're going to have, which is more very much related to communications, right? So how these intercellular communications can happen so that a new, new functionality may emerge, new, new activity may emerge, and also differentiation. So how also they can like generate new cells at some rate and create an, a new type of tissue. Of course, my work uh, and the work I've done before with colleagues is mostly on the patterning and morphogenesis. 
and that's what we're really going to talk about moving forward. But it's basically capturing, of course, like when you talk about these populations, we can have natural cells and artificial cells together acting um, as a, some sort of network. And now the, the idea is that how can we control this and provide something that's human made? So for the tissue engineering based, we have this example here, which is called the Xenobots. Um, if you don't know about it, please Google. It's really, really interesting stuff. Uh, was pioneered by Michael Levy and Josh Bengard in the US uh, in Vermont and Tufts University. And they showed how actually an AI guided this approach. How can they do this, let's say, uh, package of tissues, different tissues of frogs, uh, even cardiac and ectodermal uh, parts of, of, uh, of a type of tissue and they build this living robot, Xenobot, and it can actually move. It's quite interesting. Right. But for me, what uh, I've obviously I'm a communication engineer. I spent uh, almost three years working with uh, people in, in the medical department in Finland. And what was interesting to me is to see how can we either understand more of the communications, of course, that we've been doing for a, a lot of time, but how can we control it further? And I was really privileged to be part of this work here that we look at these chemicals and how they interfere with their communication. And I think this is serve as basis for us to develop new types of morphogenesis and patterning as well. So what we did was look into narrow astrocytes networks but they are coexistent in the same culture. And then we try to replicate uh, different conditions. One of them was induced seizures. And for that, we used these chemicals for APN GABAs. What was really interesting is to see here that the activity induced by these chemicals and also the connectivity patterns that we uh, extracted from the neuron and astrocyte cultures shows that there are some ways that are not completely dependent on, let's say, genetic components uh, that we can use to control communications. And I think this is really interesting uh, because it shows that uh, we shouldn't neglect all this sort of, com uh, let's say, ex let's say not so well uh, famous in our community, maybe uh, chemicals, we can consider them to improve, even optimize our communication systems that we use with cells. And of course, there is also the problem of delivery of these chemicals as well, because they're, uh, of course, chemicals in a fluid, they have to travel, they have to diffuse. And to be honest, I haven't seen yet, um, how can we do these two together, but hopefully in the future. So um, what I want to do, basically, what, what we have been investigated is, okay, so if we have this population, is there a way that we can control it and deliver some sort of uh, human-based functionality? So it's a little bit of in engineer, tissue engineering, but it's more related to the activity of these cells. So, of course, they have the internal intercellular molecules and in that they... Uh, diffused through gap junctions or synapses, right? Um, but what we want to do is, if we have some kind of natural disease signal, can we pack these cells together in a population and that we uh, use and process this information and deliver the human design function that we want? And you can think of applications for regeneration or the stem cell-based treatment. And I want to do this because I want to deliver first uh, as some sort of a starting point logic case. So that's as an initial, let's say, ac sort of activity that's not purely based on uh, just natural activity, something completely synthetic. And of course, many can argue, oh, but, uh, but natural cells can do indeed do computation. But what I'm talking here is controllable. Uh, delivery of computing, not just an interpretation of a natural response of a cell, right? So then this control becomes important because I don't want only to control a unit uh, uh, as some sort of a single cell. I want to control the network. And then I, can, I need to think about these chemicals. I need to think about also ways that I can deliver these morphogenesis. 
And one of the ways that we think is packaging them into these microfluidics, the chips, okay, so that we guide the connections. It could be guiding where the cells can grow, even or can form gap junctions or can create synapses. So we have a lot of options there, but this is uh, an actually existing technique in biotechnology with microtunnels. So you can see a lot of the literature around that too, and it's quite exciting. But can we, once we have designed these human, once we have gotten uh, these populations that acts with a human design function, can we package those into a device? And then it's very exciting because then we have a, a, not a product, but something, a contingent to present to various uh, industry, including pharmacological industry, right? Because they could use this to test and discover drugs for certain diseases and so forth. So I we work a lot with um, neuronal communications, uh, which could be uh, obviously dependent on molecules. And for that, we present, I present here two cases, neuron to neuron communications and also tripartite communications, okay? And the main difference is that actually presence of another cell, another brain cell called astrocytes. So the astrocytes, they're really good because they act as a regulator of the synapses. And here is the channel, as you can see in the examples here. So there are ways where either the transmitter or the receiver will interact with the astrocyte, but maintaining high quality of communication in the channel. So why not use these astrocytes as well? But the way we're going to work is um, we're going to show examples of these uh, logic gates implementations with neurons uh, solely, and then we're going to move forward with the astrocytes, and we're going to see some experiments as well. So when I was uh, still working uh, with Dr. Saz Tarabas women, and I had the pleasure to do my PhD with him as well. Uh, in, during the postdoc here, we worked with one of our students, uh, Geoffrey Adonias, into looking at how neurons can deliver uh, solely neurons here and only a small network with three cells, how can they deliver or end and or logic gates. And we were very careful here because we wanted to do obviously work with simulations, but deliver something con contingent, right? And credible results. So we looked at the human brain project and we got a bunch of uh, here, we have 14 types of neurons with has, they have different internal properties, reaction diffusion properties and so on. And also morphologies. And the morphology that the neurons have dictates the amount of spikes uh, per second that they have, or, or firing rates, if you will. What uh, we decided to basically look into is, is there a compatibility issue here? What types of cells we need to connect to which types of cells in order to develop these uh, logic functions? So we come up with these eight cases here between N and R gates. So we demonstrated that and everything worked nicely. Of course, we need to make sure that the synapses is set up properly. So that of course, uh, the, the currents can uh, be originated at the receiver cell. And the, you can see the outputs because obviously the receiver cell is basically where we're gonna measure the outputs as you can see over here. But um, is this all done? Is the work done here? No, because we also we wanted to investigate the future applications where these logic gates, they actually work inside a uh, population as well. So for example, we look at the network structure of a microcircuit and we uh, try to replicate as much as we could what we look like in terms of, uh, let's say, consider biological plausibility. But we also managed to add these logic gates inside the microcircuit. And now things became more interesting because on when, as you can see here, the microcircuits are divided by these four layers. Well, it's actually six, but uh, typically we group together layers two and three because of some uh, nice little characters that they have in common. Um, we actually use specific cells from each layer and specific probabilities that we, they have for connections. This created its own dynamics. Now, when we add these logic gates into already existing 
uh, functional microsocket, there will be some communication happening with the logic gates uh, uh, already with the microcircuit that will interfere, of course, in the functioning of the logic gate itself. So we measured that. Uh, we, of course, did some uh, simulations where we analyzed the variations of the spike per second in each of the inputs. And as we can see, the higher uh, the rates here will have the less of accuracy. And uh, of course, when we talk about logic circuits, we always want 100% accuracy, right? We, we were not used in logical uh, digital systems to have this sort of uh, problems, even um, unless you have some kind of thermal noise or something like this. We use, uh, so now things become more interesting. So since we have this challenge to, for featuring vivo applications to add these logic gates, we need to think of how error needs to be uh, handled. Of course, we did some analysis here. As you can see on the right-hand side, uh, we have some three plots with the spiking rates and the threshold of uh, uh, activation of the, the receiver cell. And uh, this is important because by varying this threshold or some internal states of the cell, we can actually increase the accuracy up to very promising levels near uh, 95%, okay? which basically means that, right, so if you have the capabilities of changing uh, completely these uh, parameter inside a cell, then we would have many exciting optimization opportunities, but in fact, changing this threshold inside the living cell might be very, very hard to achieve. So we need to keep our eyes open. So more recently um, with uh, a student, a master students that uh, I had the pleasure to work with, we analyze the contributions of these accuracy problem uh, if we, you add the astrocytes. So the astrocytes, like uh, I've mentioned before, they can act as a regulator of the synaptic channel. They, so then if there is some sort of uh, interface between the microsocket with these devices, can we add the astrocytes surrounding these logic gates um, so that also, and also basically controlling the logic gates themselves as well, uh, so that we can provide uh, more and more accuracy. So we try to analyze this scenario. And of course, Julio went on to an analyze ends and OR gates as well, but he did, uh, he managed to do sequential ones, sequential logic gates, he even managed to do uh, flip-flops, which we're still working on in terms of uh, uh, papers, right, for the future. Uh, but what he noticed uh, is that we have these feedbacks from the output neuron with the astrocyte that they're really useful. And they might not be necessarily synchronous. So one is uh, something that's very fast, which is the extracellular increase of potassium that we have, which leads also to uh, the increase of uh, calcium signaling in the astrocyte themselves, which leads to the release of glio, uh, glio, uh, glutamate or, or gliogs. And that helps the synapse maintain high, let's say, uh, high conductance, and of course, in increase the currents that we have in the output neuron that are based from uh, the synapses themselves. But of course, there is also a, pro a production of calcium that is low, but comes from the IPT production based on the glutamate present in the synapses. So the glutamate will react with the membrane of the astrocyte and initiate the whole cascade that is really slow uh, in, in this case to produce more calcium and for more, uh, more gliones, right? So he analyzed this as a form of a narrow control solution. And we actually got uh, really interesting results because right now we in added a synthetic source of noise. And what we were able to see is that the astrocytes are actually handling this increase of noise, this basically near increase of noise quite well uh, for all logic, logic operations uh, sets that we have uh, to validate our logic gates. Right, so having said this uh, and still working with uh, with Sazi as well, we managed to 
uh, get some collaborations going with uh, Menakshi Calavello in the Tampa University as well. And the good news is that um, we were able to engage in some really interesting experiments. But uh, while we work with Menakshi, uh, we noticed that there is a, a little opportunity of uh, envisioning what these logic gates can be useful for the future and you start talking about these unconventional devices, right? Where we name these neural molecular computing on a chip devices, where we have uh, not only logic gates, of course, we only demonstrate logic gates, but we can further think of logic circuits when given the fact that you have these compartments and they are uh, built together somehow. Right, so what what basically we wanted to do is explore a little bit of the dynamics and the noises that can actually be a part of the signaling of these astrocytes. And here we only use astrocytes mainly because um, uh, Menakshi's group, he was an expert on astrocytes. So at that time, we didn't investigate much further of this relationship between neurons and, of course, astrocytes. And that may maybe a way to the future we don't know yet so we have to still keep going but over here it's purely based on astrocytes and we're not using spikes we're using calcium signal so which is the primary uh, let's say uh, signaling molecule of this astrocyte okay with with this what changes is the calcium is a lot slower than spikes of course and the dynamics uh, can be arguably be uh, a little bit more complex what we wanted to do is use some sort of reinforced learn approach where we analyze first uh, the culture that we have and try to measure its dynamics. And then we try to set up some sort of communication metrics or uh, try to adjust how communication is performed inside the culture so that we can optimize how we deliver these uh, logic gates. And now, one way that we wanted to deliver these logic gates is thinking not only of the synthetic gene transcriptions or whatever synthetic gene we came up with, but also can we use chemicals? Can we use different controls of, of the astrocytes themselves based on different drugs, right? And this obviously Menakshi helped us a lot to figure it out. So here's a little bit of the, of course, I call it a logical operation design platform. Oh, you can see more in the paper, but we analyze outputs of the culture, such as the noise between the cells, the delay between uh, the signal propagation between uh, different cells, of course, and also the causal signaling amplitude. And based on calculating some probabilities, uh, some, uh, of course, not probabilities, but basically treating the data, calculate some statistics, we can build the state value outputs of functions where we can link certain conditions of the culture with certain parameters like the threshold of activation of calcium and TB, which is our transmission period. So those two, they were very important because we did some reliability analysis first uh, ahead of this. And we've seen that those are the most dominant parameters in our simulations. So the, this was not really also a closed loop design. So it was more an open loop uh, in, in a way. Uh, so, but uh, I mean, we did analyze the culture first, did some simulations, analyze the TB in thresholds that will be interesting, and then communicate that to Minakshi to uh, sort of uh, package these into the experiments. Right, so when I'm talking about these two inputs, I separated these in the following way. So we have the common input, which is the synthetic gene, but however, uh, obviously, sorry, the synthetic gene will change the sensibility of the cells to calcium production. Okay. And then we have the usage of the drugs, the end and the or, uh, or, which basically are different drugs, different compounds. Okay. So, of course, uh, they have this kind of structure and names. Uh, of course, in the paper, we have more um, more information, which is just uh, interesting in time now. But... Uh, in the end, we analyzed um, the, the fluorescence, the light that will be emitted uh, when you have the Fura 2AM molecule combined with calcium. And we actually were able to successfully implement the logic gates, uh, which was really fantastic news. And obviously, we analyzed 
how the interactions between the genes and the compounds would make our intercellular calcium signaling increase, and that would be important because then we could play along with this set of uh, conditions to deliver the uh, all the um, all the logic operations that we want from each gate. Okay, of course, intercellular calcium uh, uh, also flow uh, also has its uh, behavior over time but we also play with that to make sure that uh, these logic operations were delivered. Right, so this is really exciting because now we talked about these results and obviously we didn't much about the packaging, which is our future ongoing work. But uh, what we notice is that we can have these neuromolecular chips, but you can think of cardiac molecular computing chips, epithelial molecular computing chips, and um, we also have bacteria uh, computing chips as well uh, that we, we have achieved, not achieved the cardiac and epithelia, but the bacteria we have worked with. And now we can think of uh, creating this device, the epilogen synthetic. So it's I see it's them a little bit different than organ on chip devices, especially because we change how these uh, populations, they function, their activity as well will be something new. We want to upscale that, of course, not stay in logic gates, logic circuits, maybe and even some kind of vulnerable non unconventional devices. And hopefully th there are some future application neurodegeneration pharmacology. Right, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you can reach me by the email and also thank to my funders as well.